I'm a senior lecturer at CASA, the Centre for Advanced Spatial Analysis in the Bartlett Faculty for the Built Environment here at UCL. And the sort of work I do is around um, data, data visualisation, usually in the urban realm, cities. Um, so large scale data sets typically tr to do with transportation, movement, sometimes social media, and also digital humanities, so looking at looking at large text, corpora, large collections of text and, and, and trying to extract particular insight through automated analysis of those. So typically uh, if I'm uh, applying for a, uh, a research council grant I'll have to consider research data management um, fairly early on and they will expect me to provide a fairly good account of what I'm going to do with the data and how I'm going to provide le legacy support for it and things like that. So. Um, a, not all of, but a big chunk of the thinking will happen uh, then for those larger funded projects. For smaller projects, um, it tends to happen on a more ad hoc basis, uh, in the same way that it does with sort of um, uh, the software you might create. And you might create a few tools um, to sort of make sense of the data, but it's not until you get to the point where you're going to pu publish it that you would really package it up in a meaningful way and comment it and make it understandable. So I think there's a sort of analogous process for smaller projects which evolve more organically. The data management is a bit more ad hoc for those. So I would always try to share data that I use in, in my research uh, with the wider community and, and, and you know, my preferred default is completely open. And there's reasons why that might not be possible, either privacy of participants, commercial sensitivity is another reason. So we do projects with sort of transport providers or occasionally um, mobile phone companies and people like that don't, you know, you can't share their data. Uh, and then there's some issues around copyright if you're looking at um, anal analysing large bodies of text. Generally that analysis is, is um, no one's going to be too upset about that, but if you were to then start publishing large chunks of those works online and sharing them for, you know, so, you, so other scholars could reproduce your work, um, that would probably be more problematic. So it's important from the perspective of pure baseline, other scholars being able to do the same piece of work that you've done, um, which I think requires the data, probably requires the code that you've used as well, and the methods through the form of the academic paper. But more broadly, a lot of the work that we do, the data's um, it's often open access anyway, um, so it's not necessarily an issue to share it in a modified form. And the audiences for that data, as well as for the results, um, might be outside academia, so you might get policymakers, hackers, you know, tech people who might take that work and run with it, ideally. So I like the idea of being able to push it to a, a, a group of people who aren't, you know, uh, don't have the privileges of, of a research contract. Generally the sort of data that we deal with, there, there aren't necessarily storage challenges, but there may be challenges of serving it. So we do do projects which are kind of public facing and they're web-based uh, and then making sure that data is available and the platforms are available um, is, is more of a challenge. We, I don't think we work with any data that's so large that you know, we can't you know, physically fit it in the building. If you, if you, uh, excuse me, and we have to shift it to a sort of a large scale resource which can store and handle larger sets of data. That hasn't happened yet, I don't think. I can see that happening more in the future. I think this no notion of big data in, in social sciences and sort of spatial sciences, I guess, that you could say that we work in, big data that we deal with can largely would be dealt with on a server or a desktop machine on a relational database. And these sort of more sophisticated technologies that deal with distributed storage, distributed processing and analysis can handle large, you know, larger data sets, or petabytes of data. I don't think they've quite come into our field yet, despite the excitement around it, though I think they probably will. In terms of the, uh, the need with the data that we work with, a, a big one is legacy. And we have this sort of slightly contradictory situation where research councils expect you to provide legacy without funding, essentially. You know, uh, uh, you know uh, the, the money runs out at the end of the project, but they'd like five years of legacy. Uh, in some cases that's not so difficult, and storage is not necessarily a huge issue. I mean, I can put data on a hard drive and lock it in the fireproof safe. But if what you want to do is make it accessible, that's a different matter. And if you want to have a service, so we've got lots of projects which are web mapping projects where we're um, providing, say, detailed architectural history on a building-by-building -building basis in a part of London. That's one of the projects we work on. The service is the live thing there. Um, and then that's a different level of requirement because you need a web server that's, that's, that's kind of up-to-date and isn't, hasn't got security holes and, and can deal with the capacity of any visitors that might come along. So there's these different levels of, I mean, 
you know you could print the data out and keep it in a, in a filing cabinet, but that's not that useful. So having service access and legacy is harder, and I think having some way to support services which do that very effectively and keep to, up to date with quite a, probably quite a broad range of modern technologies is really um, desirable.